Okay, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, please come and take your seats, don't be shy, we have three empty seats at the front here. Welcome, my name is Dr. Daniel Natush. I am a conservation scientist representing people for wildlife. Before I begin, I was having a conversation earlier today and I thought this might be an interesting test. Who here among the audience uses exotic skins, exotic reptile skins? Can I see your hands or thinks that using reptile skins is good? Does anyone, and don't be shy, does anyone think using reptile skins is bad? Where I come from, this would be called preaching to the choir, giving a talk like this, so I won't hold you in suspense. The title of our talk today is Reptile Skins, Is There a Future? And I give away the answer. The answer is yes, and we are going to tell you why. We will tell you why a group of conservationists like myself are speaking to you positively about a trade that uses animals. I represent the world's oldest and most well-known conservation organization, IUCN. And we have a policy with an IUCN to support trades that support people, that support wildlife, that support biodiversity conservation. Most of you are probably very aware of images like this a narrative that using reptile skins is bad, that it's wrong. You hear the same about furs and other animal-based raw materials. But this narrative is not supported by facts. It is not supported by science. It's not supported by evidence. The reality is that for the last 50 years all over the world, the trade in reptile skins has given rural people, millions of rural people, a reason, an incentive, a financial incentive to care about things like these. A dangerous man-eating predators, giant snakes, people in the developing world, in Africa, in Asia, Latin America, they don't want to live with these animals. They eat their children, they eat their livestock, so how do we, as conservationists, say, I think you should keep the crocodiles in the river. They don't want to keep the crocodiles in the river. And this trade, over the years, has allowed us to not only, through conservation, through sustainable use, conserve these animals, but also prevent this, to prevent the destruction of natural habitats because these animals that people make their livelihoods, their businesses, their livings out of, require these habitats. And so through this system, we not only conserve crocodiles, snakes, lizards, important reptiles, we also conserve the habitats they need. And so this is one of the most powerful, one of the most impressive, one of the most successful conservation success stories there are. And so today you're going to be hearing about why reptile skins are supported, why we believe they're sustainable, why the science shows they're sustainable. You'll be hearing from Dr. Patrick Ost from the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom who will be speaking about why the world is slowly awakening. We're no longer Hearing this narrative, we are slowly beginning to hear the true narrative about the benefits of reptile skins. Then we will hand over to Miss Christy Plott from the Alligator, Louisiana Alligator Advisory Council, who will give you a real-world example of how this works in her backyard. You will there hear from Kathleen Klomp, Senior Environmental Manager at Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, 
LVMH, who will speak to you about brand expectations and why brands are supportive of exotic skins for the same reasons that we are supportive of exotic skins. And then finally, we'll hear from Grégoire Biassini, who will be speaking about some of the initiatives worldwide that are happening to showcase why reptile skins are important, to help you if you are using, brands if they are using, local people if they are using, to help them improve this trade and ensure that, yes, as I said, there is a future for reptile skins. So without further ado, I hand over to Dr. Patrick Oss. And before I do, I would quickly like to give a big thank you to our friends at, at UNICH, and particularly Julia, for allowing us to present to you today. So thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, following on from what Dan has just said, um, to help us answer this question of whether or not there is a future for reptile leather, it's perhaps easiest for us to begin by taking a deep dive and having a look at how the reptile industry matches up with trends in sustainability. And we can do this by looking at something called the green recovery. And when we take a deep dive into sustainability, what, what, what is sustainability made of? And then we compare that to some of the key issues that underpin the reptile industry. It will take us a long way towards answering this question of whether or not there is a future for reptile leather. So what we're going to do today is we're first going to have a look at three important meetings that happened last year, the outcomes from those meetings, and then we're going to have a look at some of the key fundamentals, the biological fundamentals that underpin reptile leather, and then we'll see how they align. So the three meetings we're going to have a look at, the first is COP26, uh, the, the United Nations Climate Change Conference that happened in 2021. The second is the World Conservation Congress. Um, and the third is the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And broadly speaking, these meetings represent the environment, biodiversity, and human well-being. So one of the, <clears throat> the sort of remarkable outcomes from these three meetings is just how similar the sort of uh, uh, the, 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 the messages that they're trying to deliver. The, the way the outcomes are aligning with a very common denominator for the solutions. And these the common denominators begin with things like global challenges are increasing. Whether it's global warming or pollution or biodiversity loss or food insecurity, they are all on an upward trend and at the moment they're showing no signs of turning that corner. Transformative change is essential. There is no longer an option for business as usual. We need to change. Uh, sorry, getting a bit lost here. Um, we know now that more or less the solutions center on biodiversity the environment, and social equity. One way or another, these three pillars are going to be essential when we look towards finding solutions. There needs to be a strong focus on adaptation and resilience. We're not going to solve any of these problems anytime soon. We need to think of innovative solutions that allow us to accommodate them and live with some of these challenges. A strong signal to the market to invest in an indigenous peoples and local communities. And a strong signal to the market to invest in sustainable use of natural resources. And of course, as we see today surrounding us, all the vast majority of the, um, the vast majority 
of the reptoskins we see here are quintessentially natural resources. Directly or indirectly, they are linked to nature, natural systems. But reptiles are very special natural resources. They're very different to many of the other natural resources we see. And this is because they have spent the last 65 million years focusing on resource efficiency, on energy efficiency. That is their evolutionary imperative that allows them to survive on planet Earth. And so we see things like reptiles are 90% solar powered. As an animal, they derive 90% of their metabolic energy requirements directly or indirectly from the sun, free solar energy. That's how they power their bodies. They are specialists in surviving shocks. These animals have, have adapted to live in extreme environments. Have you ever thought why reptiles are one of the most common animals in deserts? Why are they so common in Australia? They are extremophiles. They have spent their evolutionary time specializing in how to survive in the challenges that are awaiting us in the world to come. They are a very good option, for example, for surviving the challenges we see with extreme weather events or indeed the COVID pandemic. Reptiles don't transmit dangerous viruses. They have never, because of their cold-blooded uh, biology, physiology, they have never been linked by the World Health Organization to any of the dangerous disease pandemics that we've seen, whether it's COVID or bird flu or swine flu, Ebola, MERS, SARS, it doesn't matter. As, a, as an animal, as, as a group of animals, they are very safe species for us to have in our agri-food systems. And reptiles emit one-tenth of the greenhouse gases of conventional livestock. Again, because of their cold-blooded biology, they don't emit anywhere near the same level of CO2, methane, or nitrous oxide. They have a very, very efficient digestive bi biology. So in effect, they are the equivalent of, of uh, renewable energy resource, uh, resource within the animal kingdom. And these biological traits line up beautifully when we have a look at a formal uh, cradle-to-grave life cycle assessment of environmental impacts, something which the uh, Sustainable Apparel Coalition has already done through the Higg Materials Sustainability Index. And what we can see is that reptile leathers wind up being one of the best performing materials in the fashion industry. In fact, in this particular lineup here, second only uh, to pineapple-based synthetic leather. But as Dan mentioned, alluded to earlier on, it's not just about mitigating negative impacts. It's also about what contributions are our products or our materials making towards planetary health. And when we start to look at that more complex real-world situation, we can see that reptiles are coming out trumps. For example, the reptile industry is fundamentally pro-poor. We know that as cold-blooded animals, reptiles are most common, they're most abundant in the tropics. And thus, most of our sourcing takes place in the global south. It takes place in parts of the world where poverty rates are very high and increasing. It takes place in parts of the world where environmental stresses, the impact of climate change are predicted to be worst. It takes place in a part of the world where food insecurity is increasing. 22% of the children living in Asia and um, in Asia and Africa suffer from childhood stunting, an irreversible condition that compromises mental and physical well-being for the rest of their lives. Um, and this is largely because of uh, a lack of high-quality protein and micronutrients, in other words, meat. 
And we know that in the global south, reptile meat is a cultural norm, much like chicken and fish is a cultural norm in the global north. Over a billion people regularly eat reptile meat. And so I'm sure many of you here today are very familiar with what we call the Global Sustainable Development Goals. And this is a broad suite of targets that loosely define what that green economy is going to look like, what, sustain what sustainability looks like. Oh, it's, it's a very complex set of goals, and a lot of them are interconnected. But when we do a crude analysis, what we see is not surprisingly reptiles come out, reptile leather comes out right up at the top of that list. The reptile industry contributes indirectly or directly to at least 11 of the 17 sustainable development goals. So is there a future for reptile leather? Well, in conclusion, we know for a fact that the reptile leather industry contributes directly to biodiversity conservation, ecosystem services, and human rights. We know that synthetic alternatives do not match the depth and breadth of these contributions. It's a little bit like a robot versus an Olympic athlete. We know that that robot can do a very small number of jobs very accurately with a high degree of precision. But if we put that robot into a complex situation, like for example, to play a team sport, every time, oh, every time um, we'll find that the, the, the human, the Olympic athlete will outperform it. And we know that reptile leathers are well placed to contribute towards the re green recovery. And so I'll leave you with this question. Well, this, this challenge. It's up to you to decide whether or not you feel the reptile leathers have a future. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Pat. So these are the types of questions that the scholars at Oxford are mulling over in their minds. As you can see, the summary is that when you do these analyses, when you look at some of these questions, is this material more sustainable than another material? If you are a designer, a purchaser looking at a range of materials and you want to understand in terms of sustainability credentials, what materials can we be using? Reptile skins comes out very, very well. And Christy is going to speak to you now, like I said, about a real world example of how this plays out and takes place. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I'm Christy Plott. I work for the Louisiana Alligator Advisory Council, uh, which is uh, under the umbrella of the Louisiana Department of Wildlife. And in Louisiana, we have an incredible success story. And uh, that is our American alligator. Sorry, Pat, I'm gonna do a better job than you did. So, wait a minute, did I miss one? No, I didn't, ah, there we go. So we're gonna talk about sustainable use. In the 1960s, there were less than 100,000 American alligators in the United States. Today, there are upwards of 5 million. In the state of Louisiana alone, it's over $250, $250 million a year economic impact. When you consider that Louisiana is one of the, uh, it ranks, I believe, 49th or 50th in economy and opportunity. Those are really important numbers. Millions of dollars in wetlands restoration projects have been raised through this industry. And when you take a look that only 2% of wild alligators are culled each year, these are pretty significant numbers. I think I've got a slide missing, but that's okay. So we're going to talk about the fact that in the state of Louisiana, just like Dan was saying, how people don't necessarily like to live alongside dangerous wildlife. There are 3 million alligators in the state of Louisiana, 
and there are 5 million people. Put that in perspective. That's pretty significant. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the amazing things about this industry is how it protects wetlands. So alligators are not fish. They do not nest in water. They nest on land. And they nest in wetlands. And only 6% of the earth is covered in wetlands. And that ecosystem is disappearing faster than any other ecosystem on the planet. In the state of Louisiana alone, wetlands are disappearing at a rate of one football field every hour by erosion or all of these things. And this industry, landowners, and 80% of the wetlands in Louisiana are privately owned by regular people. And they need money to undertake wetlands restoration projects. A big source of that income is the income that landowners receive by selling alligator eggs to farms, which then end up supplying luxury brands. Without those dollars, those restoration projects would be unable to, to happen, or the government would have to step in and pay for it. So why are wetlands efficient? Wetlands are like a sponge. They soak up all the, the gunk in the air. I'm not uh, going to be quite as technical as Pat. and. You know, these, these wetlands are super important. And every year, coastal wetlands sequester enough carbon to offset the burning of one billion barrels of oil. They're also, they sequester 50 times the amount of carbon as terrestrial forests. So far more effective than even rainforests. So it costs approximately $150,000 to restore one acre of wetlands. And like I said before, the primary source of income for surface resources to landowners in the state of Louisiana is the sale of alligator eggs. So where do you think those dollars are coming from? It's coming from watch traps. It's coming from handbags. It's coming from footwear. So while we don't necessarily think of the luxury fashion or luxury market as helping something like that. This is an incredible byproduct of this industry, of how fashion and luxury actually helps local communities. It provides jobs. It protects habitats. And let's also talk about the fact that these habitats are also home to seven to 8,000 other species of plants and animals. And this is directly protecting those habitats and keeping them in their most pristine form. So demand for products drives demand for eggs, which creates a demand for the landowner to create more land and more wetlands for nesting habitat. And what happens if the fashion industry goes away? What happens? Well, like I told you that wetlands are sponges, if they dry up, they also release the gunk back into the air. So it's really important. So according to the United Nations, more than 85% of the world's wetlands have vanished, making investments in alligator habitat conservation more critical than ever. And failure to restore these wetlands has a far greater consequence. So the alligator industry is an, a very, like, unlikely but powerful ally in the fight against climate change. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about gators today. And I'm going to pass it back off to Dan. Thanks so much, Christy. And that story is not unique. You often probably hear about alligators. Some would say it's, it's the most well-known story, but that story plays out with snakes, with lizards, with a range of reptiles in Africa, Latin America, in Southeast Asia. And I'm going to hand over now to the person you've probably come here to listen to most, Miss Kathleen Klomp from, from LVMH, who will be speaking about why brands, and when brands do their homework, and they know what they're talking about, they know their supply chains, why they are increasingly supportive of these materials because these same stories that conservationists, that governments, 
that scientists are beginning to see, they are becoming more mainstream, and hopefully you, as the brands are beginning to begin to understand and share this story. I hand over to you now. Thank you. Wow. When you listen to uh, Pat and Christy and Dan, um, there's only good reasons to be proud of using exotic leather, right? Um, when, you look at all, when you look at all those benefits. So um, is there a future for reptiles? Yes, there is. But only under conditions. So I'm Katrin Klomp, I work for LVMH, and perhaps you're not all familiar with uh, LVMH, the group. Um, Riviton with NC is a worldwide um, luxury conglomerate. We are composed of 75 different maisons or houses, and um, we have six different uh, group activities. So we're specialized in uh, wines and spirits, in um, selective retail, um, in watch and jewelry, in luxury, uh, in leisure and um, um, culture, in perfumes and cosmetics and fashion and leather goods. And you might think that the only group activity where we do use exotic leather or leather in general is in leather goods. But that's actually not the case. Throughout all those different six group activities, we do use leather. And I can give one example. Um, Belvedere, for instance, uses leather cases for their bottles. LVMH has been for a very long time committed. Um, it has been committed to the environment actually since 1993 when we developed, um, when we founded the environmental um, department at group level. And I can give you two examples. Here on the right side, uh, you see a, um, I apologize for the French language, um, a publication that we made in, in 2019. And it says, nous n'avons pas le luxe attendre, or we do not have the luxury to wait. Sustainability has to happen now and here. We cannot have the luxury to wait. And on your left-hand side, you see a communication that actually um, was published three weeks ago. And this is the very first time in history that a group of this size publishes alongside financial results extra financial information. And I mean by extra financial information, the impact on people that we can have. For instance, the group used 30 million euros. They put it at the disposition of employees in the group in need during COVID. Environmental, we have a commitment by 2030 to restore and preserve 5 million um, hectares of um, uh, land. And so this is the first step. We know that um, we're not there yet, but it shows symbolically that we are starting to unite financial and extra financial information. And so we're working towards sustainable growth. And we can see that in the commitments of the group and the four values of the group, the four values are excellence, creativity, entrepreneurship, and commitment for a positive impact. So that commitment is actually based on a program that's called LIFE, LVMH Initiatives for the en Environment. And those initiatives, they are articulated around four pillars, circular uh, creativity, transparency, preservation of biodiversity, and the fight against climate change. So how do we um, adapt those four pillars to today's topic, which is reptile skins? Well, when you look, sorry, I've got a little issue, but when you look here, you see that in terms of biodiversity and in terms of transparency, we have created an animal-based raw material sourcing charter that was published in 2019. And that charter integrates four, um, three different pillars, transparency, traceability, the second one, animal husbandry and trapping, and the third one, um, people and environment. When we source exotic leather, we need to look at all those three pillars. 
So that's a responsible supply. But once we have purchased those materials, we also need to be responsible in the way how we use those materials. We cannot use the life of an animal and actually just use one third of the skin. We need to optimize, to maximize the use of every single skin. And that is what internally in our manufacturers we're also doing. And last but not least, this, what we're currently having as four pillars, they cannot sustain without our stakeholders. And I mean by that, our customers, our clients, but foremost, our suppliers. And I see a lot of them here in the room today. And without you, we wouldn't be able to achieve these objectives that we have here. So going more in details, and going more in details of what we actually are trying to achieve. In terms of responsible sourcing, we wish that by 2026, 100% of our strategic materials and reptile skins are part of those strategic materials. 100% of them need to respect the highest standards by 2026. We also expect that by 2030, 100% of those same materials are fully traceable. So that means that if tomorrow we purchase a skin of lizards, we are going to expect that we have got information on the hunter, on the trapper, on the collector, on the processing facility, on the tannery. And we do not want that information just to have the information. We want that information because we want to link it to those responsible practices. And that's where you get a full chain of custody or chain of responsibility. And then also we've got an objective by 2030 that is those five millions of hectares preserved. And through the intrinsic benefits of exotic skins, of, of reptiles, we can achieve that um, objective partly thanks to those materials. In terms of sustainable use, um, we want to have 100% of our products resulting from eco-design by 2030. And our teams are already actively working towards that, towards recycling, towards maximizing the use of our materials, towards achieving certification of our materials, and also develop circular services. That means that if tomorrow someone comes to a Louis Vuitton store with a broken alligator bag where there is a skill missing, we want to be able to provide a service to the customer that they can reuse that bag. Or even, why not totally redesign the bag? Because after a couple of years, they're not interested in that color anymore, we can change that. And that is the circular services that we're also um, investing in. This, these efforts, as I said, we cannot achieve them just by ourselves. And it would be a lack of humility to say that we can achieve this by ourselves or to try to impose this to our strategic and important stakeholders. Actually, we need to work hand in hand with the industry. We need to work hand in hand with our suppliers. We also need to have robust facts that actually under, that, that can underline and that can um, make certain that everything that we're trying to achieve actually does have the impact that we're trying to intend to get. We need to work with researchers, scientists, experts. And also, we need to contribute to multi-stakeholder initiatives. And I have a few of them that you can see here. Um, SARCA, for instance, the Southeast Asian Reptile Conservation Alliance, where we work with our competitors together, with a lot of tanneries together, with rangeland states together, to improve the responsible supply of uh, reptiles. We also collaborate a lot with ICFA, but I will leave the floor to Grégoire to give more information on that. And of course, the ostrich business, business chamber. This is more for ostrich, it's not a reptile, so it hasn't, it, it hasn't changed, but it is an exotic letter for us, so it's important also um, to underline that. And then last but not least, we rely a lot on our own um, suppliers and our own supply chains. And so uh, we, for instance, also work towards developing a standard that is um, dedicated to uh, DLVMH crocodile farms. So as a word of conclusion, um, reptiles are extremely important to the group. 
and we will keep on using those materials. And you can see here um, in the back an image of the Atelier Vendôme that opened officially yesterday. And I want to congratulate the Louis Vuitton teams that are sitting here in the room um, because it's the very first manufacturer located in France, owned by LV, that is processing exclusively exotic skins, nothing else. So that shows how much we are committed to this material. We are committed to this material. We want to be holistic. We believe that we cannot just look at animal welfare. It is an extremely important topic, but we also need to look at the impact on people, on the environment. We believe that exclusion is not the right solution. It is working with our partners to achieve positive impact. And we believe in freedom. We believe that our brands and that our customers can decide whether yes or no they want to use an exotic skin on their bag. But if they do, we need to reach the highest standards. And that is something that we need to work on all together. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm going to uh, leave the floor to um, Dan, who will introduce the Grégoire, well, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. You've done a wonderful job. As said, we're not here alone. Yes, reptiles have high sustainability credentials, but there also needs to be work done to make sure the supply chains are robust, transparent, animal welfare is taken care of, traceability, legality, and there are initiatives to help assist with that, one of which is the International Crocodilian Farmers Association that Gregoire will present to you now. Thanks, Gregoire. Very happy sharing this information with you and my fellow speakers. As Kathleen said, there is a future for exotic leather, but under conditions. And we, at ICFA, we are bringing those conditions together for the future of reptiles. So we all know that uh, our industry is questioned. Fair enough but we need to answer. And as we are all aware, we have very good facts and stories to tell the people, to convince about the future of our exotic skins industry. So ICFA is a French association. Um, the members are from uh, the whole industry. Farms, of course, uh, tanners, brands. Uh, it has been created a few years ago to put together, again, the right conditions for the sustainability of the crocodile leather. We have uh, very clear objectives. We must enforce sustainability, and we have two pillars I will explain shortly. And we must not be shy on communication. We must change the narrative, as Dan often says. We must respond to the questions we are asked. And this is also why uh, we have created this association. Makes the demonstration that responsible use of wildlife is sustainable. And if you are not a member of ICFA already, I have this leaflet for you. Please join. As we say in French, the more crazy people we are, the more we laugh. But it's not only for that. The more effective we will be if we are numerous in ICFA associations. So the two pillars for our sustainability, the first one, of course, is how we work. The sustainability of our farming practices. We have developed standards, science-based standards, and the farms, the member farms, must comply with the standards and are certified by third parties, independent third parties, about their compliance with the standards. Those standards cover all the fields of farming. And there's no bad question on that. Obviously, we care about crocodilian health and about animal welfare. It's a quick question. We do have answers on that. We obviously uh, have a high scrutiny on traceability, because that's another key question from the industry. 
and of course we watch environment and biodiversity as a whole. And the standards are really the best possible outcomes, but we are continuously financing and developing research to improve all the practices, farming practices, we are currently developing in our farms. And how does that work, this uh, sustainability? The second pillar is a conservation success. And not only conservation, of course we take care of the wild animals and we need the animals, like Christy explained in Louisiana, to recover from close to extensions 50 years ago. That was the same not only in Louisiana, but in most places of the world where crocodiles live. Um, and the economic model which supports the conservation results and the sustainability of the industry is a viable economic research, uh, model based, as Christy explained, on egg collection, which provides revenues to rural communities and also, in some cases, at the end, some animals are uh, brought back to the wild to increase uh, the populations. And this is not only um, a conservation success. As Christy mentioned as well, there are huge impacts, positive impacts, social impacts for rural communities, environmental impacts in fighting climate change, for instance, as she mentioned. And with those two pillars, best possible farming practices plus conservation and environmental uh, case studies with high success, we are very delighted to have the conservationist support. And you may be aware that every time some people renounce to using, for instance, exotic leather, the conservationists have signed up to say this is the wrong solution. Dan mentioned that in introduction. We will be effective in maintaining wild population, in preserving environment, in preserving rural communities, taking care of the people, by continuing going on with this reptile skin industry. This is key for the future of the people and of the animals. And you see here, you may not be able to read, but most of the greatest experts in conservation, including Dan, of course, and Graham Webb for the crocodiles, for instance, all the specialists from the conservation side of IUCN have written to luxury CEOs to really prompt them to resist the pressure and to keep developing this industry for all its benefits. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gregoire, and to all our other speakers. That is our message today. To you, it is a counterintuitive. It's a strange narrative. How can you kill an animal? An animal is dying, often beautiful animals. I love snakes. When I was a young boy, I said, when I grow up, I'm going to conserve snakes and lizards and crocodiles. So how can you then be standing up and supporting the death of an animal? And that's because ethics, ethics should be judged in their entirety. When I think about the death of an animal, the fact that I know that it creates benefits for local people, it feeds school children in impoverished communities, it protects habitats. When you look at holistic ethics in their entirety, some people will say, no, for me, killing animal is too much and that's okay but for many of us and the people here those benefits which we've proven through 50 years of science and you've heard a little bit about today that is a real story and that story that truth needs to be told and that is your story we did the show of hands at the start I think everybody here favors the use of reptiles so we are preaching to the choir but this is your industry, this is your story, so please take this story and tell it. We have for you here some facts and myths. They say, are the snakes skinned alive? Do the snakes give you COVID if we use their skins? The answers to these types of questions are in here. We have booklets in French, 
Chinese, Russian, Italian, Spanish at the front, please take them. So without further ado, please put your hands together for our speakers. And if you have any questions, please put up your hands. We would love to answer them if we can. Thank you very, very much. Does anyone have any questions of our speakers today? And guys, thank you. Cheers. Come on!